Uh, yeah. um, so I, I want to read Ken's bio instead of trying to memorize it and just dismiss something. It's it's pretty impressive. He's he's been been around the industry for his his whole career, and and we're we're glad to have him working with us. So he's he's our executive director, and he's been with us since October. Um, <clears throat> Ken, Ken completed a PhD in marriage and family therapy at Purdue University in 2002. Uh, Dr. Yu's Dr. first job after the doctorate was in an adolescent residential treatment setting as a therapist. That job changed the course of his career. In that setting where almost all of the variables impacting a team were controlled, <clears throat> positive change where, where controlled positive change became a likely outcome instead of a, a surprise. Being adopted himself, Dr. Huey was always drawn to the large population of other adoptees in residential treatment. He ultimately became convinced that this population needed specialty care, and in November of 2006, Dr. Huey founded Kalo. Kalo was and is a specialty program for adopted youth who have sig a significant trauma history. Kalo grew to a 200 plus employee organization with about the same numbers of teens, of teen clients served each year. And I, I will add in there that <clears throat> Kalo is, is a leader in our industry as far as that type of treatment goes, at least until we, we surpass them yeah. within the next, uh, next few months. Um, <clears throat> so uh, Ken, Ken has, has six children and two and a half grandchildren and three any any day hasn't happened yet right no, <laughs> coming up pretty close so I'll turn the time over to him thank you it's good to be with you so i want to talk a little bit first and kind of make sure that we're all on the same page and that we know what to expect and uh you know no big surprises coming the first thing is now, I guess you all know what Havenwood is. Anyone, anybody who does not know what Havenwood is? Okay, let me talk real quickly then about that. Havenwood Academy is a residential treatment center. I didn't know what that was when I finished my PhD, but <laughs> residential treatment is also where Oscar works. And um, it is a place for, well, in our case, teenagers will come and live in the facility, hence residential, to get pretty in-depth treatment for significant issues. In our case, it's trauma and the after effects of that. There are those that work with uh, much more sort of um, organic issues, you know, schizophrenia and stuff like that too, but there's residential treatment centers then across the United States and you've got a few within miles of where we sit. There's three or four pretty good ones, okay? Next thing I'd like to know is kind of what you all do. Who here is in the medical profession in some way? Nobody? Name some things that you do. Real estate. Real estate. Who's in real estate? Just one. Other other things you do? Teachers? Any teachers of any kind? Okay, we've got a teacher. Insurance. Insurance? Anybody in that industry? Okay. A lot of us are retired. A lot of you are retired? Well, any in that industry? That retired I can't even in remember industry? what we did. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fair enough. I want to just understand my audience a little bit. Uh, but nobody in the therapy prof profession then other than the little group that I was talking about. We're no. here because we serve. Here because you serve. All right. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, any of you ever heard of ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experience Study? Raise your hand if you've heard of it. Oh, hey, that's more than I usually get. That's fantastic. We'll talk a little bit about that. I won't go too far into it, eh, but a little ways. And in fact, I think maybe we'll all kind of understand what our own ACE score is. All right. First, we have to understand what neural connections are. And to understand this, you need to understand that neurons that fire together, wire together. By that I mean, if I say, what does a dog say? We all say, woof, okay? That's a neuron, dog, that fires, fires with woof, and so those neurons come together and create a neural pairing, and now we don't have to really think. You don't go search through your memory banks, pull out the file that says dog to say woof. I say dog, you say, okay, really easy. Neurons that fire together, wire together then, which includes not necessarily good things. So let's talk about something that's not bad or good, but just as scary. How about a bear? 
if we had a bear come through the door here and was growling and you know uh, saliva coming out of its mouth, we wouldn't have to think about you know is this is this bear here to you know hang out and, and do uh, <laughs> the smile song or is it her here to hurt me? We immediately go into panic mode and run. That's a good thing because we know <clears throat> without thinking about it that there is danger present. All right. We know about these neural pairings at such, to such an extent that we've actually got now video of them happening. So let me describe it. You take a neuron then on one side that is, for instance, dog, one that says woof, and when they come together in the learning process, they actually link and save us time. There's neural, neural synapse that a message has to get across to the next neuron and travel on down the neural pathway. With that link, it's a quicker fire. You can charge a cell phone by putting on one of those little mag magnetic things or whatever, right? But it's a slower charge than plugging it in. It's similar to that. Okay, so let's take a look at this. I don't know why the music is just what it comes with, but I'll turn that down for now. We don't need so much of the music. Okay, so you can see this real time on a brain scan. You got a neuron here and dog, woof, boom, it connects. There's a connection we've got, all right? Now let's watch it in slow motion. That's, that's how it happens real time. To think you can actually see learning take place is really quite something in our day and age. Dog, woof, dog, woof, dog, woof, dog, woof, boom. We've got ourselves a neural connection. The nerdy scientist in me Jones is on that. I just think that's super cool. Okay, now, it can connect all kinds of things. Uh, the smile song, you're not having to look it up, it's, and, and it has an immediate feeling for you. Um, for you just to hear that the smile song and have a kind of a, a, a warm feeling, raise your hand, that, that have a little bit of that feeling. That's a neural connection. It's a positive thing. It can have negative effects too. What about trauma that gets wired in a neural connection? Okay, that's where we're gonna really spend a little bit of time here. And I've got till what time, tell me? 15 after. 15 after, I'll make sure I'm done by then. Okay, so, <clears throat> let's think through rape. Uh, kind of a tough concept, tough, well, tough subject, and I apologize for that. We're gonna hit a few things that are a little bit hard that might uh, pull at your heartstrings a little bit, that's okay. It's safe in here, don't let your neural wiring, uh, your neural connections freak you out, have you too scared, you don't need to be, it's gonna be okay. But. If somebody, male or female, is raped, talk to me about what some of the consequences might be socially in their lives after that. Intimacy. Intimacy what? Just difficulty being intimate. Difficulty being intimate. Why? Why would that be? Because the trauma triggers that particular Absolutely. So, so the trauma from that rape then affects later relationships because you start getting close and you're panicked and your heart races and things like that based on this prior trauma, all right? That's tough with a rape, but what if your rapist comes home every single night? Yeah. That's the girls that we work with. Their rapist has come home every night for maybe eight years. In fact, I'll show you a profile of a young lady that just left our program that, that had something like that. So you think about a one-time rape, that's very, very bad. But if that's a perpetual thing, you are wiring that brain to have the fight, flight, or freeze mechanism turned on all the time. That becomes a problem. So if I'm wired with this neural pairing that touch, are you okay with touch? Mm -hmm. Okay. I need to make, you know, ask permission, but just this much touch, and all of a sudden my resting heart rate goes up, my eyes dilate and become fixed, my breathing changes and I get ready to fight, flight, or, or just freeze. Um, that's a problem. I don't know how to do normal human interaction. I don't know how to be touched in a safe way. Okay. <clears throat> so let me tell, show you just kind of typical, this is what happens with kids then, where the rapist comes home every night. An actual young lady who just discharged. I'm gonna have to read it up here, I can't read it down there. Actually, somebody, who, who read this for me? Please. <laughs> Birth parents struggled with alcohol and drug addiction and attempted suicide on two separate occasions. Next line, somebody else. Was beaten and strangled by her birth mother on several occasions. Her birth father did nothing to protect her. Next. 
Josh. I've been in the care of child and family services for eight years. Eight years out of the home. Oscar. Sorry, I can't see that point. Oh, sorry. <laughs> numerous, <laughs> pla numerous placements at psychiatric hospitals and residential treatment centers. And finally, birth parents' rights have been terminated and are completely out of this client's life. You know, think about all of those traumas going on and how that wires the brain then to tell that kid non-verbally, the world is not safe, flat out. Every interaction is a possible harm to me. That's what my brain is telling me if I have this kind of a profile. So, those are adverse childhood experiences, A-C-E. Adverse Childhood Experience Study is the ACEs. This is a big deal. It's 20 years old now, and thank heaven some of us know about it. This is changing medical and psychological care in the country in a big way. This really, really matters. So let me tell you a little bit about it. Dr. Vincent Flitti was a gentleman who was working uh, in a, an office that had a whole bunch of, of obesity. And it was anywhere 30 pounds to 100 to 400 pounds overweight. And he wanted to understand what are the antecedents to morbid obesity in women. It was a women's clinic. And so he starts trying to figure it out so he can deliver better care. Uh, comes up with um, some money through a grant to do a national study with a few thousand people. And goes out and asks questions about their past, kind of how they grew up and things like this. And by accident, asked a woman, one of his people did and then he did it too, Asked a woman if she'd been sexually abused, who was morbidly obese, and she started crying and said, indeed, that was the oh, really?
Ding ding, I'd like to welcome you guys to uh, our uh, Rotary Club meeting. If you could get everybody to stand up. Yeah, unfortunately we don't have the bell, but uh, traditionally we ding it and everybody arises, so. Ding dong, very good. We're going to start out with a Christmas song with that, aren't you, Zero? Okay. Uh, instead, we will sing, um, well, we usually do a, a patriotic song, unless somebody would like to. I think we should sing a Christmas song. Does anybody want to shout out a Christmas song that we can uh, that we should sing? Jingle bells. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you say no, then you have to come up with a song. I mean, Christmas song. This is it's the serious part of the program. Silent night. Silent night it is. <laughs> so we'll sing Silent Night, and then we will uh, be led through the Pledge of Allegiance by Jeff, and then Zura will give us a prayer. Silent night.
before we leave the Pledge of Allegiance. All right. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful to gather in Procarians for this <clears throat> luncheon today and to get together and to enjoy each other's company and to learn together. We're grateful to be able to serve this community as Rotarians. We ask a blessing upon it that it will be strengthened during this Christmas season. We ask that bless those that are ill and, and struggling with their health that they can be strengthened and healed. Uh, we ask that those who are uh, in need during this Christmas season and be blessed. We ask for that blessing upon the food we have taken, that they nourish and strengthen us. And we pray for this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Smile. Smile, and the world smiles with you singing a song. Don't be cheery, just be cheery all. found the same thing, continued to ask that question, added it to his protocol, and found out that 67% of those women that were morbidly obese had been sexually abused. Oh, wow. This changed the course of his study. So now he did a big one, 17,000 people, and uh, added essentially adverse childhood experiences, sexual abuse, trauma, you'll see it on this other slide, but uh, three different types of abuse, sexual, physical, and emotional, and two types of neglect, physical and uh, emotional, and then five types of family dysfunction. Uh, somebody in the family having a mental illness, somebody going in and out of prison, the loss of parents through adoption or foster care or whatever, five different kinds of family dysfunction, okay? And those became the ones that became predictive. Really good factor analysis and stats applied to the study that helped us show that these are the ones that really made a difference, really impacted things. Every major chronic illness and social problem that we face in this country, every one of them has huge, huge drivers in the trauma world, adverse childhood experiences. It's amazing. So we're, we're treating things wrong in some ways. We need to be pay, paying attention to trauma more often and we're starting to do that. Okay. So these neural pairings that accompany the trauma then are tripping our fight, flight, and freeze system. So that, that which is turned on burns out or burns in. It burns out the brain in the area where this is held 
or it burns it in and has us constantly flipped on. So if you take your right hand or your left hand, whichever you are, and hold it up in the air, put one finger like this and fold your, your fingers down around it. That is the human brain. On the outside is the cortex, prefrontal cortex. On the inside, this is the limbic system. Okay, you can put your hands down. Inside here, this is nonverbal, non-responsive in terms of language, experiential, and that's where fight, flight, and freeze are held. So if a bear comes through here, I don't have to talk to it with my prefrontal cortex. That's where we do that. I just feel it all over my body. I have an adrenaline dump. You felt that cold chill down your spine before. Things slow down. That's because we're seeing more frames per minute, essentially, if you use a camera analogy, because that's what happens to our body when we have that kind of ad adrenaline dump. If that becomes normal for me, I'm walking around in slow motion. I'm seeing Oscar, and he's a large man stand, Oscar, for me. I give this guy a hug. It's like being hugged by a bear. The dude's got some strength. Thank you very much. I knew he'd be okay with me utilizing him. He scares the crud out of me. But he does something really cool. There is warmth that oozes out of the guy. It's part of his I hear about him almost every day that I'm at Haven with. He makes that kind of an impact. Okay? That's part of what's going to change things. We'll talk about that here in a minute. Okay, so the other thing I want you to understand about it is that the more of these that you have, it's not the more the merrier, it's the more the less merry. So if I've got a one ace in my childhood, you know, I'm adopted, and that's it, that's not necessarily a big predictor. Two is not a predictor, three is not a predictor, four is the magic number. If I have four or more, the wheels are coming off. That's just the deal. Okay. This is the Adverse Childhood Experience Inventory. You want to know your score? Let's do it really quick. Okay? I think we've got time to do this and then talk about the rest of what we've got. So we'll actually just, I'll read them really quick. Um, here's how you score it. If you say yes to any of the prompts that I'm going to read right now, give a one. You can just do it on your hand. One, and then no to the next one so you do nothing. Yes to the third so you put out a finger. And by the time you're done, you'll know what your score is. <laughs> did a parent, before your 18th birthday, did a parent or other adult in the household, often or very often, swear at you, insult you, put you down, or humiliate you, or act in a way that made you afraid that you might be physically hurt? If yes, one. Did a parent or other adult in the household often or very often push, grab, slap, or throw something at you or ever hit you so hard that you had marks or were injured? These are all, again, prior to your 18th birthday. Three, did an adult or a person at least five years older than you ever touch or fondle you or have you touch their body in a sexual way or attempt or actually have oral, anal, or vaginal intercourse with you? Four, did you often or very often feel that no one in your family loved you or thought you were important or special? or your family didn't look out for each other, feel close to each other, or support each other? Five, did you often or very often feel that you didn't have enough to eat, had to wear dirty clothes, and had no one to protect you? Or your parents were too drunk or high to take care of you or take you to the doctor if you needed it? Six, were your parents ever separated or divorced, or were you adopted, uh, lost your parents before you were 18? Was your mother, number seven, was your mother or stepmother often or very often pushed, grabbed, slapped, or had something thrown at her, or sometimes often or very often kicked, bitten, hit with a fist, or hit with something hard, or ever repeatedly hit over at least a few minutes or threatened with a gun or knife? Nine, did you live with anyone who was a problem drinker or alcoholic or who used street drugs? Nine, was a household member depressed or mentally ill? Or did a household member attempt suicide? And 10, did a household member go to prison? Okay, now you count up what you've got on your hands. Um, if you want to participate, do. And if you don't, just sit there and listen to me. You don't have to answer this. Anybody here who has a zero? Congratulations. Okay. I just did this with our whole company and all of our girls, and I don't know that we had but three or four zeros out of 60, 70 people. One, who has a one? Two, three, Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. What do we have? Six or seven tens? Something like that. So I'm a seven. I'm a seven. Seven. That reminds me of 
<laughs> Brian Regan, a real good comedian, talks about say eight, say eight relative to pain, so you get pain meds. <laughs> say eight. Um, that's the number. Say eight. Say eight. Um, okay. So those of us sevens and above, fours and above, everybody four and above, raise your hand again for me if you would. Has it made a difference in your life? Is what I'm saying resonating? Absolutely. Yeah. Are you doomed? No. Nope. But doggone it, it costs you. So I have a significant trail of destruction in my wake in some ways. Now I've repaired a lot of that and uh, really in my 20s is when things, I started to get some stuff going back together and, and, and it got better. We're trying to help kids then that are teenagers that are in the middle of this, it's just happened, where the effects are just being seen, they're dissociating, they're having all kinds of issues. All right, what do we do to fix it? Well, <clears throat> this is experience. Remember, talking to this doesn't help me. A, it has no ears. Our oral capacities do not wire down into the limbic area of the brain. Talk therapy is a waste of flipping time. Don't bother. It's experientially created. Talking to this only helps me to the extent that it creates enough emotion, experience, to create some change down in here. So talk therapy can be beneficial with adults to some extent to help them work on what they need to do to rewire the brain, but the talk doesn't produce the change. Does that make sense? Okay, so it's experientially driven. We've got to fix it experientially. I've had experiences that have taught me touch proceeds by two to three minutes sex. <clears throat> I don't fix that by saying, hey, that's no longer the case. That doesn't make sense. My prefrontal cortex might get that, but it doesn't change the feeling that I've got going on inside. So yesterday, <clears throat> I hear a whole bunch of commotion and screaming. I look out my window, and here's a young lady. I'll call her Trudy. And uh, it ain't going well. And I run outside, and we have to actually put her in a hold. She has no dang idea why she's flipping out. She can't. She's really, truly. I'm talking to her. She has no precursor. She was just trying to talk to somebody. As I drill a little deeper when she calms down a half an hour later, it turns out that she just started to have a panic attack. Her limbic system took over, and she started to go into fight, flight, or freeze, and everybody's trying to tell her, calm down, it's okay. No, that doesn't matter. We gotta get to her limbic area of the brain and soothe her, and we, were just, we weren't able to do that. So there's some things that we need to do as staff to help slow that down. What does it look like? How do we fix it if it's experience? First, I want you to hear about the five R's. Repetitive, relational, rhythmic, rewarding, relevant experiences. This comes from the work of a guy by the name of Dr. Bruce Perry. Phenomenal gentleman in the <coughs> Everything I do fits somewhere under these. Repetitive, relational, rhythmic, rewarding, or relevant experiences. The idea is that if I have this neural pairing, touch equals sex, and I tear those two neurons apart. I can do that, but that's not how we relearn or change. That actually kills both neurons. That's not helpful. We do brain damage to fix trauma in the wrong way. So rather than tear bad neural pairings or non-functional neural pairings apart, I need to wrap them with more neural pairings until this becomes less strong than the other new neural pairings. Tell me your name. Sue. Sue? Mm -hmm. So Sue just gets used to, I just start having an intervention where I touch her in some safe zone and we do it from the wrist along the, here, across the back to the other wrist. And I just, I make it a habit that we touch. And over and over and over, repetitive, relationally, she gets used to this kind of touch until it stops freaking her out. We deconstruct or reconstruct a better set of neural pairings that overpower the old neural pairings. Make sense? Okay. So what are some things that we can do specifically? Touch, as I said. Animals are phenomenally effective. And the reason for this is they're generally non-threatening and they're very rarely the instruments of abuse. Now think about this. My abuse generally comes from males who come to me and physically hurt me or sexually hurt me. Animals aren't typically used by that person to scare. It does happen sometimes, and so, so then it, that we have to take this off the table. 
But generally, animals feel soothing because they don't have any of this baggage attached to them. There's no neural pairing saying they stink. <laughs> So I'm going to begin with our program now. I'd like to begin by introducing those guests that are here with us today. Uh, we'll introduce our speaker here in just a minute. Um, but Nathan, if you'd like to introduce your other guests. So this is, this is my wife and my five-week-old. My, my other two kids are here, but uh, brought, brought the little baby and my wife. Welcome. Thanks, Amy. Frank. I'd like to introduce Aaron C.V. He's been my friend since he was born. <laughs> Welcome, Aaron. I brought my girlfriend, Mari Hobson, and my husband, Lee. But they both have been here. Yes, they have. Thanks for coming. Here. Let's see. Anyone else? And then I have a guest over here. This is Justin Christensen. He uh, works with Enzyme Engineering, a consulting engineering firm that uh, that our company uses. So. so we gotta go through a couple of announcements. Um, I'm not sure if you've checked your email recently, but there was an email that went out regarding Newman. Uh, Newman is the current SUU student body president from Africa, if you recall. He's got an amazing story of how he uh, got here and, and pursued a life, has pursued and pursuing a life of education and uh, trying to make all of that fit and work. He uh, is in need of some financial assistance to continue uh, so that he can finish up his bachelor's degree. So any of you who would like to help with that, uh, from what I understand, all you have to do is uh, call the financial office or write a check there to the to SUU, the financial office, and uh, you can just endorse on the check of who it's for, and they'll get it to the right place. Um, 
And then I, I believe as you do that, as you write it out to SUU, then you can um, receive a, a tax uh, benefit for that. Paul, do you know how much he needs? 4,000. Yeah, 4,000 is what was requested, so. Paul. Yeah. We used to have it set up so we could ante up and do like right now. Somebody takes the cash and figures it out instead of going through what you're talking about. Okay. The hat right now, and somebody takes it over there. Yeah. Um, Karen Johnson can do that, and if you want to make out the check okay. as you, you can give it to her. She'll be here shortly. Yeah, we could we could definitely do that. Um, does anybody have a hat to pass around? Because we've got a play. Um, and, and maybe we could do a pledge too, or you know, you could pledge uh, some things that way, Frank. That's a good idea. Uh, so the next item here is a reminder of the Christmas play, It's a Wonderful Life, the fundraiser for our Interact Kids. And there should be a sign-up sheet that's going around and that way, um, just as a reminder, you can you can pay multiple ways. But um, if you do want to if you do want to pay through the club, that is possible. So Karen's got that in the back. Karen, anything else you want to announce about that? No, I just want to say the kids did a really good job, even though selling tickets they sold almost two thirds of them. But yeah, that's me for the last six weeks. So I think they did a great job. So. We've had a club without a meeting, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's been tough, but uh, big thanks to Bob and Karen for facilitating that and helping those kids along in these weird times. Uh, just a reminder, next week we will be meeting here again, and we'll be hearing from the candidates. Uh, we'll be doing our election for uh, the following Rotary year. So we'll be holding uh, that election next week. And with that, I'm going to turn the time over to Diana for our Rotary Minute. And then we'll turn the time over to Dave after that for uh, Sergeant at Arms. So good dogs, we use equine therapy at a real high level. We have a, a specialist and go out four times a week where this big, powerful animal can over and over and over again have a repetitive, relational, rhythmic, rewarding, and relevant experience that also helps rewire the brain, okay? Uh, whoops, the two. Safe humor. This becomes really important. I'd show you a video on it, but it, it takes a little while. Just the way that you interact, absent sarcasm, but constantly bringing it to a place of laughter and joy. So your smiling song is really powerful that way. It just brings a feeling to you. If we can do that with rhythm, relationally, rewarding experiences, through humor, through laughing together, telling jokes, even watching movies to some extent, but not, not too much. But humor can be injected uh, with real wisdom, can be very, very powerful. Brain spotting. This starts to get a little bit technical and catches one of the things that we're just adding to our program. Uh, EMDR is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. And that's also really good for what we're doing. Brain spotting is a little bit better. It essentially um, takes the air out of the intensity of the emotional experience that happens when we've got neural pairing and, and rewires it. What, golly, it's, it's kind of biofeedback done by keeping somebody's attention going back and forth between two points while they think of a tense, an intense feeling that they have and we blow it up. It would take a while to go too far into the science, but I'm just trying to say that there are ways then really specific scientifically that I can't handle inside of a home environment, but put me in a residential environment with trained professionals, I can tackle it with something like brain spy. Very powerful and quite new. That's also only in the last really 15, 20 years that it's gotten a toehold, and now the science is starting to catch up. EMDR is the same thing, it's only about 25 years old. It was found by accident by a doctor walking through 
through Central Park in New York, actually, who had been raped and eyes were moving, and, she, and she's the one, her name's Francine Shapiro, she's the one who started EMDR, which ultimately led to, to brain spotting and, and really allows us a fast way to tackle some of the issues that are happening for some of these kids. And finally, safety. Safety in and of itself is a powerful tool to creating change with these kids. Just loving them is not enough. Parents frequently get frustrated because they think, well, I'm connected with my child, and, 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 and I adopted her, and, and I love her, and she knows that. that. That alone won't do it. But a safe environment with these things injected helps change. Now, can we really actually, I mean, think about the level of this trauma. I'm a, I've got a seven score, you know? Sixes and sevens, and that's a lot of trauma. Can we fix it? Let me show you a video that I think proves conclusively we can. There's a gentleman who uh, had worked with a gorilla when it was younger and uh, had formed quite a bond, and then they released it into the wild. He wanted to go see this gorilla in the wild, and you're going to see them going to do that. When he got out there, it had, they had tried to have other human contact, and it had attacked other humans, so they're a little bit nervous. So he has a little conversation with his team and says, okay, if it comes after me or if I get killed, here's what I want you to do. I mean, this is kind of a scary thing. Here's what happened when he found his friend, the gor gorilla. Dang it, I can't fast forward it, so I guess we're gonna have to watch, we'll watch the first couple of minutes. Sorry. Damien Aspinall is on a very special mission deep in the African jungle. This is no easy expedition. It's like searching for a needle in a haystack. Damien's trying to locate a gorilla called Queen, who he hand raised in England and released into the wilds of Gabon five years ago. It's a very, very sweet gorilla, one of the first gorillas we took back to the Gabon and released back into the wild. I wasn't quite sure how, how he was going to react. He'd attacked the last couple of um, sort of human contacts that he'd come across, so it was considered dangerous. But after days of searching, on, a familiar face appears from the dense jungle canopy. When I found him and, and you know, jumped out of the boat and onto the side of the river, half of me was thinking, was this going to go wrong? Damien briefs his team to distract Queen if he turns hostile. To throw food if it kicks off. Uh, and certainly when we want to go, throw food, but throw it away from us, not near us. What happens next? is the most tender of reunions. I knew as I got onto the riverbank and I heard his grillers of a deep love gurgle. I knew then that, um, that I was okay. A love gurgle? Yeah. It was extraordinary, really. It was probably one of the great moments of my life. He embraced me and um, was talking to me all the time, all the time he was talking to me. I was fine. I was actually a bit more worried when he started introducing me to his wives because some of them were wild caught and they don't know me. He thoroughly embraced you. He did, yeah. I didn't want me to go. Like an old friend. Are you kidding me? Look at that picture. If we can rewire a gorilla through repetitive, relational, rhythmic, rewarding, and relevant experiences, we can save kids. Thank you very much for hanging out with me.